Praise God. Hallelujah. Good evening. We're going to talk tonight about prayer. So I'm going to give a, a minute or so for people to log in. Um, it'd be a good idea to get a notepad out. I'm going to give uh, quite a few scriptures tonight about faith and about prayer and how to get results. About how to get results in prayer. Amen. So uh, the main subject I'm going to take out of James chapter 5. Uh, we'll pick up, uh, not yet, but eventually we'll get around to verse 13 to the end of the chapter. But uh, I have a list here, some scriptures that I've written down. Uh, this is in no way an exhausted list. I have so many more that could make this list. But just to give you just a brief overview of, of the subject, and then I'll, I'll probably be teaching on this again in the near future. Good evening. God, God bless you, Miguel. I see you, brother. All right, so Luann, hey, James, God bless you guys. I see you. We're going to pick up first in Mark 11, 22, and tw 22 through 24. Um, I can't tell you how much this, this verse here has come alive to me. And I, I'll be honest, I, it, it didn't mean a whole lot to me up until the last year. But in the last year, so many of these chapters and, and verses in the Bible that, that deal with faith were... They, they didn't mean a lot to me, but now they've become such a, a integral part of my approach to God, and I believe should be <laughs> how we all approach God. Uh, let, me, let me start off by saying that, that without faith, we can never receive anything from God. Anything that we receive from God has to be by, by the, the force of faith. We have a faith God, and so everything we receive, every, every interaction we have with God has to be by faith. Remember, we're, we're told that we who are of faith are of faithful Abraham. And Abraham is the father of us all in the faith. So the, the covenant that we're grafted into is actually the covenant not of Moses but of Abraham. The new covenant is built on the covenant God made with Abraham. So it didn't end. Abraham's covenant never ended. It's a continual covenant. Hey, Adam, God bless you, brother. I see you. So the covenant that God made with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. The, the Gentile church that came through Christ is, is building on the covenant of Abraham. Now notice the covenant of Abraham was a faith covenant. And Abraham has said, believe God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness and he became the friend of God. Abraham became the friend of God because of faith. Because he believed God's word and he acted on it. That's what faith is. Faith is, there, there's a lot more to it, but simply it's believing God's word and then acting on it acting on it before you see the results. So if you wait on proof or evidence, then move, that's not faith. That's sight. So we walk by faith, it says, and not by sight. Now, all human beings walk by sight, what they see, their senses. It's natural. Uh, and But new, when we become New Testament believers, we, we develop a sixth sense, so to speak, and that sixth sense is faith. It's a sense that goes beyond all the other five senses because it believes what's invisible more than what's visible. And that idea of what faith is, is so important because without faith, we cannot please God, the Bible says. And without faith, we can't receive from God. So prayer, when we talk about prayer, prayer that, uh, that prevails, prayer that gets answers, prayer that's beneficial, that actually gets results, is prayer that's prayed in faith. And that's what we're going to cover in James 5. But first... Look at Mark eleven twenty three and 24. Such a powerful, powerful passage. The Verse 22, it says, starts off by saying, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. Have faith in God. Then he goes to the next verse, verse 23. For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say, notice the word say there. I, there's three times the word say or saith or says in, it appears in this one verse in verse 23. It's very important that you underline that because there's something to saying, uh, even in, in salvation, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. So there's something to the saying that it's a speaking from the heart. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. She said in her heart, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And she acted on what she said, but she said it because she believed it. So the word of her mouth was the belief in her heart that led to the action of her body. And when she acted, she moved, she said, she touched. And when she did, immediately it says, her plague was stayed. That, that means she received healing from Jesus because she, she said in her heart, I can, I can touch his garment and he'll make me whole. 
that saying is a saying that is a conviction of the heart, and you only sp speak out of the abundance of the heart. So when the heart is convinced upon the word of God so surely that your mouth speaks, there's a saying that gets results. And that's what, he, what he's talking about is the saying that's in faith. We know that because he goes on to say that. So listen close. He says, whosoever shall say to this mountain, and the mountain is not obviously a, a, a mound of dirt, but it's whatever gets in the way of your life that, that's either an obstacle, a hindrance, uh, whatever it is that's coming against you, it's the parallel there is a mountain. It's defined as a mountain because a mountain is unmovable. It seems impossible, uh, but we serve a God who deals with the impossible. So he says, whosoever shall say to this mountain, whatever that mountain is, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and look what it says here closely, and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So whoever does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatsoever he saith. I mean, the limitless possibilities of this verse are unbelievable. The promise of God here is so, it's, it's unfathomable that God says, whatsoever you shall say, if you do not doubt, you believe you shall have whatsoever you say. That's prevailing prayer. And then in verse 24, he confirms it again. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Notice closely here. This is important. The wording, if you just read over that, you miss what he said. Whatsoever, therefore, you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and then you shall have them. Notice the believing comes first, the receiving comes second. You don't receive before you believe. If you believe, then you receive. So there's something so significant about the issue of faith in prayer that I think it's the reason why people get frustrated in prayer. And, and particularly, we've been talking about healing. We've been talking about the greater works of Jesus, the, the works Jesus said that we are to do as believers, greater works than he did. Shall you do? Because I go to the Father. And those works are directly referenced he he was speaking in context of healing the same work that i do you shall do the same works the healings the miracles the casting out of demons the very ministry of jesus is to be the the new testament believers ministry but those greater works ministries can only be relegated can only be apprehended by faith so whatever we say we do not doubt we shall have whatsoever we say so what god's trying to develop within our heart is faith for prayer, not just to pray more. I think we've we've you know all heard people try to get people praying more and, and burdening you for prayer or trying to guilt you into prayer and saying we need to pray more, we need to pray more, and we do need to pray more. But you know, a big part of the reason that people aren't praying is because they have prayed and haven't got results. And so I, I can, I'm completely convinced that if we were getting more results in our prayers, nobody would have to guilt us into praying more. Nobody would have to convince us that prayer is a good thing. If we were getting results in prayer, we would all be praying more. Of course we'd pray. Who wouldn't pray if God was answering? If you had a direct line to the throne room of God to get results when you speak, who wouldn't pray more? Of course we'd pray more. The reason we're not praying more is because we're disillusioned by prayer because we've prayed and not received, which we're going to cover. But look what the promise. We, if we don't get the promise down, forget everything else. The Lord here is giving us this humongous possibility. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it and you'll have it. Now, if that's not true, none of the Bible's true. We know it is true. God desires to answer prayer. God is not stingy. God is not a far off uh, God who's, who's holding back his best from us as the devil tried to convince Eve. God is an ever-present father who desires to answer our prayers. He promised that again. He said, if you being evil no, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father uh, give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Again, that's another promise. Uh, another promise. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the apostle John, obviously speaking, and he says, and this is the confidence which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know we have whatsoever we ask of him. Whatever petitions we have, whatever we desire, we know that we will have it from him. 
I mean, that, that confidence that the Apostle John is speaking of is what makes prayer interesting and fun and desirable and to be had and to be, to be coveted after. That kind of prayer is the kind of prayer that makes you want to pray, that will keep you in prayer for hours because you know that God is hearing your petitions. Now, if you don't have that confidence that God is hearing your petitions, and if you've prayed and mouthed words and haven't gotten results, to you, prayer is laborious. Prayer is difficult. Prayer is, oh, I don't know, I don't even know why bother. But that's what needs to change because prayer that gets results is to be the barometer of our spiritual existence. People, you know, brag about how spiritual they are. If your prayers aren't being answered, if if you're not praying and seeing results, you're, you're, you're not as spiritual as you think you are because you know a bunch of knowledge. True spirituality is getting your prayers answered. It's having a connection, a communion with God that gets results. Uh, the great revivalist Charles Finney, I remember hearing him speak of what he called prevailing prayer and the prayer of faith. And to him, if he wasn't able to pray the prayer of faith in, in something, and, and this was while he was being used mightily in America in the late 1800s, he brought revival all over New York and east up the East Coast and the North uh, of America, and he had more, I mean, more fruit, more, the testimonies of uh, of his life are amazing. I, I don't necessarily agree with every doctrine he ever made, but the, the life of the man w speaks for itself. The fruit speaks for itself. He he spoke of the prevailing prayer or the prayer of faith as the barometer of his soul, so that if he couldn't pray through the prayer of faith on a subject, he felt that he was backslidden against God, and he would he would take a day of prayer and fasting and seek God as to see, why am I not able to pray in faith in this area? There's something hindering my faith. What is it? He, he knew that if he wasn't able to pray to God in faith and get answers, that there was something wrong with his communion. Think about that. If, you know, and, and some of us, we've prayed, and we haven't got results in what we prayed for, that experience of, of that, that wall that we met in prayer caused us to not want to pray. Or if we do pray, we go through the motions of prayer, but we're not asking God to move mountains. We're not asking God to do supernatural, miraculous things. We're just, you know, mouthing words or going through the motions in prayer. But, but to Charles Finney and to many great men of God, the prayer of faith was to them the, the most sacred act as a believer because it was that which pulled down the blessing and benefit of God onto humanity. And I think we need to get back to this prayer of faith and we need to question why we're not praying in faith. And really, the, 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 the word of God is the will of God. If you wanna know what the will of God is in anything, then you need to know the word of God. We need to learn the word. What does the word of God teach? And I, I'll say specifically about healing. Uh, for the last year as I've been studying healing, I have been blown away at how much I've been missing in, in the area of scripture. There's so much scripture, hundreds of scriptures that, that God clearly shows us his will in, in the area of healing. If we aren't, if we aren't convinced of those things, then, then when we go to pray for people, we're doing what I call roulette prayer. We're just closing our eyes, laying our hands and praying and hoping something happens. And by God's grace, some, occasionally, sometimes something might happen. But I'm talking about the type of prayer that demands an answer, the type of prayer that gets results every single time. God said, if, here, John 14, 14 is another great promise. Jesus speaking said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, Mark 11, if you ask anything in faith, you'll receive it. First John 5, if we know that God hears us when we pray, so that when we pray, we get the petitions that we ask because he hears us. That's confidence in prayer. James chapter four, verse three says, we have not because we ask, or James four, two says, we have not because we ask not. So we have not because we ask not. So what, what does all this mean? The picture that is being portrayed here, the picture that's being painted of God is a generous God who's willing and desirous to answer prayers. We've got to get that side of God in our conscience. It's not God holding back. It's God generous. It's God wanting to move. As I said in, in the teaching I did a couple days ago, if you haven't listened to it, I would highly recommend that you go back because it kind of builds. Tonight's going to kind of build on. We were talking about the, the work of Christ being demonstrated through our physical bodies. Well, Christ, he spent time in communion with God, and he knew that when he spoke, Things were gonna change. He didn't, he didn't beg demons to leave people. He spoke the word and the demons went running. He healed by the power of his word. He sent his word and healed them. So Jesus, he was in communion with God and he knew that when he spoke, there was gonna be a result. And if we're gonna be the conduits by which Jesus Christ moves in this day, it's gonna be by no other means than by having that same confidence in God's provision, his promise, his ability, and his willingness 
If there's one thing I think that we need to get down in our minds, it's God's willingness to move on our behalf. It's God's willingness to heal. Now, all of us have had a, a, a bad experience probably in prayer. And I've, I've spoken to four or five different people recently that have basically in so many words saying, I prayed in faith as best as I know how and did and nothing happened. I didn't get the result. Now, we've all dealt with this problem. And I wanna, hey, Johnny, God bless you. Luann, Marty, Art, I see you guys all. God bless you. So let's talk about, this is an important subject. I wanna talk about what happens when you pray and you don't get the result. And in your mind, you prayed in faith. You don't know how to have any more faith than what you had. That is a very important point. Now, James 4.3, 1 and 4.2, he said, you have not because you ask not. Then he said in 4.3, you, you, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Now, the word amiss there, it means to be out of context. You're, you're asking improperly. It actually even means to be sick, out of, uh, uh, deformed. So you're asking but you're not asking properly. So there's something you're asking, you're not receiving because something's not right in the way that you're asking. Julie, hey, God bless you, Tracy. So what is it that then could be amiss? What is it that could be hindering the answer to our prayer? This is what James deals with in James 4. Now, there are several things that obviously can, can hinder our, our, our prayer. Hey, Reed, God bless you. There are several things that can hinder our prayer. First thing, I want to give you another verse is in John 15, 7. If you, if you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatsoever you want and it'll, and it'll be done for you. The next verse, he said, herein is my father glorified that you would bear much fruit. So get the picture of Jesus is saying, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you ask is going to be done. There's an instant and constant line of communication made between you and God the Father through Jesus Christ when we live a life of abiding. That's why the last message I preached was so important because I talked about abiding in Christ in your physical body and what that means to be linked and unified with the Lord in, in spirit, soul, and body. And that there's a communication, a line of communication. Now, when my lovely wife, my wife is on, God bless you, my wife, my lovely wife, precious uh, from God, there's a direct line. Now, when we've prayed before and we haven't gotten results, we haven't gotten uh, what we thought should have been the answer to prayer, how do we reconcile that when God is promising us that when we ask, we will receive? Well, if, if we're not abiding in Jesus, obviously that's a simple answer. Kyle, hey, God bless you, brother. That's a simple answer if we're not abiding in Jesus Christ and his words are not abiding in us. That's a simple answer that we shouldn't expect to get results. Another uh, verse I'll give you is 1 John chapter 3. And this is all, I'm just giving, these are all bonus verses till I get to my text. But 1 John chapter 3 verse 22, it says, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Now, verse 20 and verse 21 of that same chapter, 1 John chapter 3, he talks about if your heart, or in this context, the heart is the conscience. He said, if your conscience condemns you, then God is greater than your conscience. He said, but if your conscience does not condemn you, your heart does not condemn you. He said, then have we confidence toward God. We can have confidence in our ability to receive from God's word if our conscience or our heart is not condemning us. And what that literally means is if you're feeling condemned in your mind or in your heart over something that's in your life, no matter what it is, it could be sin, like something evil, or it could just be something that's not profitable to your spiritual life that God is telling you to let go of. For some, I mean, I am completely convinced God has told many to turn the television off and stop watching television at least to the degree that they do, if not totally. I can tell you it, that happened to me and I bought that for, for a while before I finally shut the TV off because it, it's addicting. There's something, and this was years ago now, but I can remember that. It was something that came into my conscience or my heart every time I went to pray or every time I went to approach God, it came to me. It was bothering my conscience. But instead of just getting that out of my life, I, I resisted God and it did nothing but cause a hindrance in my faith. So the problem with our ability to believe God and stand on God's word oftentimes is that there is something in our conscience that we're refusing to let go of. God has asked for it. God has pegged it. He's pinpointed it. And maybe because it's not a sin, it's harder to let go of because you can justify it and say, well, there's no scripture that says thou shalt not do so and so. But if you know in your heart or in your inner, inner man that God is dealing with you on something and you don't obey and even if, if, if it seems ridiculous, you don't say yes to God and 
then there's a block put in between you and your, your walk in your faith with God. So that when you go to pray, you don't have confidence. There is no confidence to be had because there's a block between you and God. There's a block in your conscience. There's a block in your faith. So John says, we know that we ask. We get what we ask because we do those things that are pleasing. Our heart does not condemn us. We don't have, we have a clear conscience. And Paul talked multiple times about the power of having a clean conscience before God, how important that is for faith. So Jesus said, abide in him. His word abides in you. You can ask whatever you want and God will do it for you so that he can be glorified. John goes on to say, the apostle John goes on to say that he knows he gets the things that he asks of God because he keeps his commandments. So obviously, if we've asked and haven't received, it could be because we're not abiding in Jesus. His word isn't abiding in us. It could be because our conscience isn't clean. Uh, it could be ignorance of his will, that we haven't fully sought out the will of God. But now, there's another aspect of this. There is, a, there is a time, and I believe it, it, it will happen to all of us, especially those of us that are trying to transition out of unbelief and into faith. And what I mean by that is we're recognizing the higher life that God is calling us to. We're recognizing that Christ wants to use our physical body to manifest his power on earth because he said that he would and he wants to. And that when he sent his disciples out to preach, he told them to heal and cast out demons, which is an act of faith. So we that have a, a desire to go into that deeper spiritual life, I believe have all tried to pray for somebody in faith and it was probably uncomfortable and required a lot of boldness and the person didn't get healed. And to, in our mind, we had faith and we can't, we can't believe that it didn't happen. Well, there's the second a a attribute of God that I wanna talk about that I think every one of us who are gonna transition from unbelief to faith, from powerlessness to power, from mundane Christianity to Christianity that gets results when we pray, there's something of a transition that takes place where God tests our faith. And we might believe in our heart, we prayed in faith and we can't believe it didn't happen, and why? And if we allow that experience to disillusion us, it will hinder us from continuing to pray the prayer of faith and we'll just either sit back and think, it's not for us or maybe maybe it's done away with as some stand or we will question we will put a, a, a question mark in front of God's will and then it will hinder us from having faith so there is a, a point where we ask in faith and maybe it, the, the results that we were believing for didn't take place and there's a wrestling inside and now I want to show you something in James okay so we're gonna from that from that that's my intro now and I want to read James 5 James 5 has become such an amazing chapter. I, I literally can remember back teaching out of the book of James. I used the first couple verses and the last couple verses. Many, many times I, pre I preached on patience, which is the first beginning. And then in the end, I preached on converting sinners or backslider Christians, bringing them back to truth. I used the last two verses of James for that and the first two for patience. But almost everything in between, except maybe faith without works is dead, I had no real, especially when I got to James 5 and it started talking about the prayer of faith, I had no real uh, need for this chapter. Like I was so disconnected from this chapter because honestly it didn't fit my experience. But the more that I've been reading James 5 and actually studying it, it's almost like I keep getting more and more every time I go through it. It's such an amazing passage. In fact, it's the only passage that even uses this word, uh, pray the prayer of faith. It's the only time that statement prayer of faith actually appears. And in it, in the context of the prayer of faith, it's directly speaking about healing the sick in the church. So it's it's in context to talk about healing in the prayer of faith. But now the prayer of faith, it doesn't it isn't just limited to healing because as we just covered in Mark 11, 1 John 5, John and others, the, the, the prayer of faith is required if we're to see any results in God. Now James uh, 1, we know... Uh, it also talks about seeking wisdom from God. I think it's verse five. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let a mask of God who gives to all men liberally. That means freely. God's not stingy. God gives to all men liberally. But he said, let a mask in faith. Notice that, without any wavering. For he that waver, wavereth is like a sea tossed by the wind. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. So the prayer of faith is for healing, but it's far greater than that. The prayer of faith precedes any activity or anything we receive from God. Faith has to come first. So let not that man think he'll receive anything from God. But now when we pray the prayer of faith, even just because we pray the prayer of faith, Sometimes we don't get the results. Sometimes we, we get disillusioned because it looks like nothing happened and we believed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let, let's start here in verse 13 
of James 5 and answer some of the, these questions. Uh, verse 13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any among you, you going through a struggle, a trial? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing, sing psalms. Are you happy? Is any sick among you? Verse 14, is any sick among you? Now, now that, just that statement, is any sick among you, would, would reveal to us that he wasn't expecting there to be a church full of sick people. He wasn't expecting sickness to be plaguing. I'll tell you, today, you go in and ask in the church, is any among you sick? And let them raise their hands. You might fall out of your chair. Uh, the, 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 the idea that we don't need healing today, it, oh, we needed it in the Bible days, but not now. Are you kidding me? There are more sick people around us right now in the church than, I mean, I am blown away. The church I'm attending, I don't even want to go into it. I, I think three-fourths of the church has a, a, some kind of a significant sickness or needs a miracle from God. It's amazing the amount of sickness that's in the church. That is not God's will. It is not God's will that the church be so sick. Not when he put... So, such promises as the one we're about to read now, but throughout the entire New Testament, there are loads of promises about healing for the believer. Why then are we struggling with such sickness? And, and of course, we have advances in medical science and so many medicines, and yet there's never been a sicker group of people on earth as there is now. Disease is rampant. We are in great need to get back to the supernatural power of God for healing. But he said this, if any among you are sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, them the elders. Now, whose job is it to call the elders? The sick person. The sick person, his responsibility is to call for the elders. The elder's responsibility is to pray over him, the sick person, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, a lot of people think that the anointing of oil has some power by itself. And I'll tell you, I've been in services even just recently within the last two weeks where it was an oil fest. There was oil flying everywhere at the altar. Everybody had oil on them and nothing happened. You know why? Because it's not the oil that does the healing. Look, look at the next verse, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Not the oil, not yelling. There was a lot of yelling going on, a lot of begging, a lot of crying, a lot of pleading, a lot of hoopla, hoopla, and no results. You know why? Because it's not the yelling, it's not the crying, it's not the begging, it's not the oil, it's the prayer of faith that shall save the sick. And look at this promise right here. And the Lord shall raise him, the sick person, up. With no exceptions, no exclusions, no nothing, nothing about but except this kind or except this person or if, or if they sinned, it won't work. That's not what it says. But it says, if they've committed sins, they shall be forgiven. The very next statement. So they're to pray the prayer of faith. The elders are to anoint, pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if they've committed sins, they shall be forgiven. So even if that sickness brought, was the result of sin, the Lord shall even forgive the sin and raise them up. Now, we need to get back to this. Now, I know people, I've, I've talked to some people about it. Well, I don't have that elder in my church. Well, then be the elder in your church that gets hold of this. Because this is a promise as sure as any promise in the scripture. Our, our experience doesn't match this, but that's just because we haven't really been convinced that this is, is, is for today. It's the word of God and that we can apprehend this promise by faith just as easily as we apprehend the promise of salvation by faith. So he goes in to say, confess your faults one to another, and that's part of it. Pray for one another. That's part of it, that you might be healed. Now, listen to what this says. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, we're talking about what happens when we pray the prayer of faith and we don't see the results. The questions go buzzing through our head and we begin to struggle. And if we're not careful, while we're trying to transition into this, we're going to meet a place. Every one of us will come to a place in this where we pray the prayer of faith and don't see the result. Well, he uses Elijah. And I think this is so important. He uses Elijah as the example of a man praying the prayer of faith. Now, listen. If you, to get this story, you can go back in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, and it starts in chapter 17 where, where Elijah steps on the scene, and he says, it shall not rain or dew for three, these three years until I give the word. So he, he, by the speaking of word in faith, he causes a drought to be on the land, okay? Now, three, three and a half years or so goes by, and it's a drought. They're in such dire straits because of the drought. The whole entire land is dying. It's death. It's a dearth. It's a famine. It's horrible times. Now, 
Elijah comes back, and let me finish the verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions like we are. In other words, he was just a human being, just a man, subject to the same desires and things in earth that we are. But he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain by the space of three years and six months. Verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, the one thing it doesn't say here that you have to go back into 1 Kings chapter 18 to get is that when Elijah came back, the word of the Lord came to him that it was time for rain. Now, he went up and he told Ahab, the king, it's about to rain. You better get your horse and go because it's about to rain. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. It's in, they're in a drought. Such desolation. It looks like a, a desert out in, in, the, in the land. People are dying. People are cannibalizing. It is a horrible place. And yet the man of God gets a word. He knows the will of God now. Okay, so he goes up on the mountain, the top of Mount Carmel to pray. Now, even though he knows it's God's will to send rain, the man prays in a fetal position. He gets his head down between his legs and with earnestness, the effect of fervent prayer, that's what I'm talking about, of a righteous man availeth much. He prays with earnestness and then he sends his, his servant to go look and see is there rain. The servant goes all the way down to the ocean to look. No, he doesn't see any rain. He comes back and tells the man, no rain. Huh. He had the word of God. He knew the will of God. He's a righteous man. He prayed. He didn't get results. Now, God said, if you pray in faith, you'll get results. Don't tell me he didn't pray the prayer of faith. He prayed the prayer of faith and didn't get the immediate results. So what did he do? He prayed again in faith. Gets down on his knees, fetal position, cries with cryings. God, send the rain, open up the, open up the heavens. You can, if you get into 1 Kings 18, you get the, ten, ten, the ten, tenaciousness or the, 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 the seriousness, the, the Bible calls the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man. He's praying with fervor and it, he sends the servant again. No, I don't see any rain. The third time, he prays again with earnestness. With, now, most of us would have already given up. We prayed once. We released our faith. We don't see a result. We don't know what happened. How come? We go a third time. He sends the servant. No results. Fourth time, he gets down and he cries again. Sends the servant. I don't know how long this takes. It doesn't tell us how long it took, but this seems to be the guy had to go to the ocean and look and check and come back to them. No, no. Four times, no rain. Five times, no rain. By now, you got to be questioning it. Did I mishear you, God? Isn't it? I mean, he put his neck on the line. He just made a bold declaration. It's about to rain. Fifth time, no rain. Sixth time, no rain. The seventh time, he, he prays again in faith, releasing his faith, knowing the will of God in the matter. He won't give up. That's what fervent prayer is. He sends the servant. And the seventh time that he sent the servant, the servant returned and said, I see a little cloud the size of a man's hand. Now, I mean, unless he had his glasses on, I don't even know how he would have saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. But Elijah knew this is it. You better get ready. It's about to be a deluge. And all of a sudden, darkness filled the sky and it was a torrential downpour that brought the harvest. Now, just think about that because this is the example that James tells us Consider Elijah. Elijah was a man. Of, now, if anybody was a man of God who knew the will of God and, and was righteous, it was Elijah. But even though when he prayed the first time, the second time, all the way to seven times with earnestness, with his head between his legs. Now, if he knew God's will, he could have just walked off and said, oh, if it's God's will, it'll rain. Why didn't he just say, if it's God's will? You know, people, we treat healing now. Oh, if it's God's will, they'll get healed. If it's God's will, this will happen. Even though it's God's will, even though you have the word of God, there's still something to the man of God, the woman of God, being the instrument, the body through which God can release power. Our problem is we get faint too quickly. We give up too quickly. We pray once and it didn't happen and then we question God's word. We question his willingness. We question everything except ourselves because ultimately it's us that needs to change. God's word is unmovable, unshakable. It's established in heaven forever. God has given us clear battle instructions in his word to tell us what his will is. And yet, even though we know his will, we know his word, assuming we're abiding in Christ, we're obeying his commandments, still we can pray. And if the result doesn't come the first moment, we get faint hearted. Now, there's multiple places, but you guys all know Daniel chapter 10. And Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. He had the word of God because he found the prophet Jeremiah where it declared God, 
God declared 70 years in their captivity. Their 70th year was up. And yet, even though the 70th year was up, God didn't just automatically restore. He raised up a man who fasted and prayed, didn't eat and didn't wash his body for 21 days. He went with fastings and cryings to God. And it took from the moment he prayed to the answer came, took 21 days. And Daniel didn't quit in those 21 days because the man was in faith. He knew the word of God. He knew the will of God. And he wasn't going to take no for an answer. That's fervent prayer. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman. This isn't gender specific. This is any, any saint of God. He pours his spirit out on his handmaidens and on his men servants in the last days. We'll all, we'll all have it. So we can all pray this prayer of faith. But there's something to God's, his willingness. We see his heart, his love. His, but there's also something to the long-sufferingness of God that I don't think we get. Because even after we've done the will of God, we don't always get instant results. Remember uh, uh, Hebrews 10, verses 35 and, and through 39, he said, Do not cast away your confidence, for it, your confidence, has great recompense of reward. But you have need of patience. Listen to this. You, you want to transition from unbelief to faith prayer? You want to transition out of roulette, trying things out, and then actually getting results? You're, you're going to have need of patience. And what patience is in the Greek is actually perseverance. You have need of patience so that after, listen close, after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while and he that is coming will come and will not tarry. Listen closely. But the just shall live by faith. And if any man draws back, God said, my soul will have no pleasure in him. So don't tell me God doesn't wait to bring results. Even though it's finished, we release our faith. We know it's the will of God. We know it's the word of God. We're sure of it. We think, I don't know what else I could have done differently. I released my faith. Well, then you need to stand. And if you don't see results, well, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. God is not uh, going to give us everything we want the exact second that we want it. I think so many of us have been guilty of praying by faith, releasing it, and then looking. And remember, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Faith has to trump sight. But we look with our eyes and we don't see results and we think, man, we must not, God must not have heard me. Maybe, uh, maybe this, maybe that. And we start putting question marks. And if you're not careful, you'll allow sight to bring you back into the sense realm where you get stumble and fall. And then you won't pray anymore in faith. You won't try to reach, re, uh, remove mountains. You're not going to try to heal the sick and cast out demons. You'll, you'll get into a, re, a, a, a reserved posture. And then you go back to your prayers that are just mouthing empty words with no avail. Listen, just because you got God's word on something, just because you know the will of God on something, and just because you release your faith, if you don't see the results right away, you're in good company because neither did Daniel because the prince of Persia withstood him for three weeks. Think about Michael the archangel was withstood from bringing the answer to Daniel for three weeks by demon spirits, by demon principalities. There was a war going on over in the heavenly realm. Now, how do we know that when we're praying, there isn't a resistance? There isn't something hindering the, the real result. If we get weary in well-doing, if after we've done the will of God, we've released our faith, if we allow doubt and, and compromise to come back in, the answer could very well stop short of its coming. I hear people say, well, if people don't get instantly healed, then it's really not the power of God because everything Jesus did was instant, so it has to be instant. Please show me that in the Bible because that's not what Jesus Christ told us when we, first of all, Jesus had the, the spirit, it says, without measure, okay? He had the Holy Ghost without measure. I'm sure he would get quicker results than many of us. We're not Jesus Christ. We have Jesus living through us, but we are earthen vessels who are learning how to yield, learning how to respond. And Jesus, in the, in the subject of prayer specifically, when he talked about prayer in, in Luke 18, he, he talked about the unjust judge who the, the woman came seeking an answer for prayer and, and the judge would not give her the, the answer. The judge kept saying no. The judge kept saying no. But then the judge finally, because of her continual coming, it said changed his mind and finally gave her the petition of her heart. And Jesus says this amazing thing. I'm going to read it. It's, it's Luke 18, verse 7. He said, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry to him day and night, though he bears long with them? So there's something about seeing God as benevolent, generous, ready to give. But there's also something we need to understand. God bears long with us. Sometimes the answer won't come immediately. And it's a test. 
Are we gonna are we gonna give up? Hey Vanessa, God bless you. Are we gonna give up? Are we gonna question God's word? Are we gonna allow sight to come in and say, well, maybe it's not God's will to heal. Maybe it's not this. Maybe it's not that. How many saints have began in faith and ended in unbelief because they didn't see the results come? We this is the point. We have to be so sure of God's will, God's word, God's promise that we stand and declare our faith. We say with our mouth what we believe in our heart and then we stand there. And if we don't get the ex exact result right away, we don't dare go back on our word to God and say, well, maybe this or maybe that or maybe God didn't want. It's not his will or not this or not that because the answer could very well be on its way. And God says, shall not we also have long suffering? Shall not we also bear long? Shall not we also stand? I mean, that's what the fight of faith is all about. It's when you pray in faith, don't see the results, and you have to wait. That's where the fight of faith begins, where we stand on the word, stand on the promises, stay sure in what God said, and the answer will surely come. Listen to what he says. Shall not God also avenge his elect that cry to him day and night, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Jesus said. He will come speedily when he comes. Listen to this question though. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? What an amazing question. He didn't say shall he find holiness, didn't say shall he find Bible schools, didn't say shall he find big churches. The question Jesus Christ asked in the subject of prayer and believing God, will he find faith on earth when he returns? Or will the church be in such a posture of doubt and unbelief that they are just mouthing words but not getting any results? Even though it's God's will to heal, even though it's God's will to move supernaturally, he still waits on a human being to be in a quality of faith that believes God's word to such an extent that they stand in the face of all impossibility and the, in the, when their eyes are saying, it's not going to happen, you didn't get heard, this is wrong, that's wrong, it's not going to come to pass, but their faith says, I don't care what my sight says, the word of God is so true, it's yes, it's amen, and I stand upon that promise until I see it come to pass. Where are those saints? I'm telling you, part of walking in the spirit is that. It, 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 it's, it's, it's not just keeping commandments. It is definitely keeping all the commandments, but it's also being in a quality of faith. We need to learn what is the will of God? What is the purpose of God? And then we need to get a hold on a word and stand there until we see the results. And, and I, I want to encourage people because I know, I know transitioning out of a place where you haven't been living in faith into a life of faith is a very difficult life. It's a very difficult walk. The transition is difficult, but that's because we're fighting for something so precious. We're fighting for the higher spiritual life that Jesus Christ promised us, and nothing that's valuable comes easy. But when we renew our mind with the word of God and begin to get the results that God promised us, our, our faith is gonna go through the roof, but also our desire to pray is gonna go through the roof. We're, our desire to be useful to God, our desire to be in fellowship with God is gonna go through the roof because we're seeing results. So seeing results in prayer is the most, I think, encouraging, the most life-changing thing because now we're actually being used by God, not because God's doing something sovereign, but because we've yielded our faith, our life to him, and he's able now to, through faith, come through our bodies and answer prayer. Amen. I'll keep talking about this later. I love you guys. God bless you all.